the person on the photo here is uh, Negin Kpolwak. And uh, Negin is what you might call a very uh, disobedient person. She is uh, 21 years old. Uh, and a few years ago, she, she is from the north part of Afghanistan, uh, from a Pashtun family. And uh, for, for context, in Afghanistan, as you may know, there has been, or there was certainly for over 30 years, um, a uh, civil war uh, during which the cultural heritage of the nation was really um, decimated. Uh, music during the Taliban from the period of 95 to 2002 was outlawed. And Negin loves music and has always wanted to play music. And several years ago when she went to her family members and said that she wanted to play music, many of her family members, including her uncles, actually threatened to kill her. And I want to I want to share this story with you uh, of Negin and of an ensemble because it's a beautiful story. It's a story that deserves to be told and retold, but also because it has implications very much. If indeed the mandate of this conference is for us to be thinking about the next 20 years of cultural policy and how we can usher in a new era of collaboration, uh, there's some very important implications. So I'll speak very quickly about this story and the story of Negin, and then highlight some of the points that I think we as a cultural field really need to address. Um, uh, Negin and her father moved to Kabul because uh, the father wanted to make sure that she would, she would be safe. Um, the family tried to find them and, and continue to uh, uh, continue to, have to, to give threats against the family, threats of, of death. Uh, but the father and the fa father and Negin were dis disowned by the family. But the father really wanted to give Negin this opportunity to, to follow her dream. And so she enrolled at the National Institute of Music in Kabul, which is an extraordinary school. And you consider the, the cultural and historical context of, this, of, the, of the country, especially so because it brings girls and boys to learn music together. Um, and so uh, this school has been there for, for several years. And one of the young women in the group, Mina, a few years ago, said to Dr. Sarmast, Ahmad Sarmast, you know, it's great to play with boys, but we'd like to have our own orchestra. We'd like to have an Afghan women's orchestra. And so if you think that the stakes were already high um, for what he was doing, he raised them uh, even higher. Most of these young women who are at the school are orphans. Many of them, before coming into the school, would sell plastic bags uh, on the street. So um, the creation of this orchestra um, was made in, 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 20, in 2016. And we at the World Economic Forum uh, were reached, uh, Ahmad reached out to us at that time and told us about this orchestra. And we thought it was so powerful. And we wondered what would it be like to bring an orchestra like this to the world leaders at the World Economic Forum. Um, and, and, so, and so we did. And the intention really was threefold. On the one hand, we wanted to help amplify the story of courage of young women who every day, when they walk from their orphanage to their school, have to think about acid attacks and have to think about people uh, potentially uh, murdering them. We wanted to bring these young women in contact with world leaders. What would it be like for these world leaders and politics, in the economy, in civil society, to think about leadership in a different way, to be confronted with a whole different way of thinking about courage and about leadership. And then we also wanted to bring these young women to Europe. We wanted to create an exchange with European citizens. Um, and you know, we wanted to leverage the, the, the power and the influence of the platform of the World Economic Forum, which gets a lot of media attention, so that we could really help foster that dialogue and bring uh, the story of these young ex exceptional women to, um, to where they deserve to be. Of course, when they came uh, to Davos, they were, it became a global media phenomenon because you might be used to Angela Merkel and, and many of the people that we know from politics and business, but you don't expect young, amateur um, women from Afghanistan to come and perform. This is Zarifa. She's the second uh, conductor from, from the orchestra. They perform the closing of the World Economic Forum in front of uh, 1,500 1500 people. Uh, and it, the global media phenomenon went all the way back home. And so as we thought about our platform, even though we are not a cultural platform, we thought about how the platform was generative of a new national conversation back in Afghanistan. The tour continued across Switzerland. Some of you may remember this was in, in January of 2017. We came here to Berlin. And the concert was just a, a week, a month after the 
terrorist attack that had happened in front of the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church. And so, such was the enthusiasm and the desire for this that we actually had to turn away 2,500 people outside the church um, at the time of their concert. It was headline news here in Germany. I, I can't actually tell you what that says, but I, I, I hope the German folks here do. Um, but um, but I, I do know that this is, a, this is an important paper. But it's just to, it's just to underscore uh, the importance of, of what this was for these girls, for these young women, for people back in Afghanistan, but also for, for us in Europe at a time when borders are closing, at a, border, at a time when uh, nationalism is on the rise, to be able to have this kind of a, of a genuine exchange with people who are not, say, on the, on the world music circuit, but really who come to offer a kind of expression that most people in Europe uh, do not have access to. And so this was really life-changing for them, it was life-changing for most of the organizers, and for many of the people who, who really encountered this. But it was very scary for them to go back. What kind of situation would they go back to? This really is culture as real life. This is not theoretical. This is culture as applied to the real life of people who have a transformative experience through a cultural process. Uh, when they got back home, they were treated, it was, it was essentially like, a, like an Olympic welcome. Hundreds of, uh, and you see here on the image, mostly men, uh, hundreds of artists and activists and uh, journalists who welcomed them, many of their family members who changed their opinion. Many of these young women left uh, without extended family members knowing about, about them coming. Um, a lot of them, because of the coverage and the, the tens of thousands of social media comments that they got, uh, were able to change the nature of their family. And they really believed that by doing so one person at a time, they'd be able to change uh, the narrative of the country. They were, uh, they were on television every night uh, talking about the image of Afghanistan that they were able to portray. Um, and again, it is real life. You know, a couple of the young women when they went home actually were married off directly. The, the family, for the family, it was just too much. Several of them have gotten scholarships to go and study music in India. Others, one has, has gotten a scholarship in the United States. One woman became the first female presenter of a music television show in Afghanistan. Uh, this is just an image of, of the school security. When they came home, there was increased security. Uh, and then life sort of went back to normal for them. This is, uh, this is uh, two of the young women um, at, at the orphanage. I share this story because, um, again, I believe it, 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 it deserves to be told and retold. These are real lives. You can learn more at Zora-Music, where you can tour uh, these, this orchestra, collaborate with the orchestra and the school, make donations. Um, and and I, you know, I, I just want to emphasize how much of, if you, if you know or have heard of the World Economic Forum, you may not associate this kind of project with what we do. And certainly it did require a great leap of faith for an organization like ours to get involved in something that's so foreign to the kinds of things that we do. Um, but we did, and we did so with, with so many different partners. I want to now very briefly talk about some of the implications, very concretely, as we think about the future of these kinds of collaborations. What we found through this process was there is extraordinarily difficult today to bring artists from outside of Europe into Europe. Uh, we might think that we are connected. We are connected through Facebook. We learn about different cultures. How often, or when was the last time, that we actually, that you may perhaps were able to have a, a meaningful, genuine exchange with people whose life circumstances are completely different. It doesn't, it, perhaps for this crowd, this international crowd, it happens more often than not, but if you think about the European population uh, as a whole, it does not happen that much. Requirements for people to come in are really in inadequate. If you're an artist and you want to come in, you have to show um, proof of income, regular income. You have to show that you have a lot of assets. Of course, if you're an artist in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, it is very difficult to be able to prove that. And for the presenters and the producers, uh, they have to share, uh, hold a huge burden uh, of responsibility, financial, for, for these kinds of projects. And so what we see is we see a diminishment of these kinds of projects. Some of the uh, resistance to uh, really doing something about this has been that you know these artists represent a really small amount of people, so why should we go ahead and create visa programs, for example? For example, there is a scientist visa program that exists, and there are talks at the parliament level, European parliament, to do a cultural visa project. Some of the, some of the resistance is to say it's only a few people. But if we think about these people, not in terms of how many they are, but in terms of the impact that they have, if we think of these artists as cultural ambassadors, then we, and, and, and this in the context of these borders closing right now within Europe and, and the 
the diminishing possibility of receiving artists, it is critical that at the European level, at the Parliament level, at the Council level, with the new, um, the new presidency of Austria coming, coming through and, uh, and, and some of the new work plans for culture for the next five years, that these issues of mobility, as unsexy as they are, are addressed if we're going to continue um, to, to uh, create these kinds of exchanges. The second thing, um, and, and, I, and I, I recommend uh, this, this uh, organization called On The Move, which is, and some of you may know, uh, an organization based uh, in Brussels that does a lot of coordination of this kind of information. And it really this concerns us all, whether we work with objects or whether we work with, with people or both. Um, this is something that is structural that we need to address. The second thing I want to address, um, based on, on the experience that we had with the African Women's Orchestra, this is, comes from the Free Muse report uh, about the silencing of artists. It's on the rise across the world. Many more cases of imprisonment, of abduction, uh, of censorship. Um, again, uh, let's consider the impact about, of, of artists who no longer are able to speak truth to power. And I want to emphasize the online nature of what, this, of what is happening. I have several artists who have told me that they have removed themselves from social media because of the threats and the abuse. And while this is uh, an issue that concerns us all, really, abuse and, and the regulation of the online space, again, we need to think about what does it mean long term, especially for younger people who want to speak truth to power, when they have no role models to look up to because of the fear of being attacked. Um, so as we think about the regulation of online activity, at the European level, at the global level, as we communicate with the big corporate giants uh, that create these platforms, we need to ensure that there's a special place for the freedom of artistic expression. The third one and final, um, some of you may, may, may have seen this slide before, it's from the Gorilla Girl, it's from a few years ago. Uh, it concerns this idea of gender and diversity in our field. We're not as diverse as as we think we are, and we're certainly not as diverse as we tell the world that it should be. Um, this, was, uh, this was from a few years ago. This is just from a couple of years ago, when you see how many women had one-person exhibitions in some of, the, some of the major museums. And if you think this is a, an American problem, uh, the question is whether or not it's even worse here. There's the nonprofit organization, We Do It Together, based in Los Angeles, uh, did a study and saw that between 2002 and 2000. Uh, 17, so 15 year period, only 7% of films in Hollywood were made by women. Um, again, this is a problem in all industries, but consider the image and the representational power of our field. If um, we want to create visions of a field, of, of a world that is more diverse, we cannot do so if our own field is structurally exclusive. It is absolutely impossible to do so. Um, so I, I, I invite you all to, to audit your board audit your staff, look at the salary pay gap, look at your audiences, look at your artistic collaborators, and ask the difficult question. Are we serving our own preservation, or are we serving society? Are we actually in the business of advancing dignity, or are we in the business of staying afloat? I'll end with just this photo of Martin. This was a, an exhibition that we did together in Davos. Of course, Martin, bringing the museum out in a place like Davos, he saw such great potential. But I shared this photo, and Mariana, one of the curators is here, is on this photo, uh, because it also has the word tomorrow. There's an exhibition called This Time Tomorrow, which today has a, has a life at the v &A itself, and currently a show about the future. But the way, the way he listens here on this photo is what I learned from him. We need to be listening more to the world, to be more engaged. And um, this is what I take away. These are the, the three or four recommendations that I offer up to you based on the experiences that I had with this extraordinary orchestra and, of course, um, with Martin. Thank you so much for, for your time.